Hi. All right. Finally, face to face. <laughs> All right. This this a segue from blades and beers. We'll have cutting edge and coffee because it's too early for beer. Yes. <laughs> and we'll do face to face. Now, this is what I love. I love looking at blades. So my guest today is Ray. Uh, one of my previous guests from Blades and Beers. Now we'll have an actual face to face, so we can actually touch, feel, smell, and test <laughs> the blades. All right, so get bro, uh, run through of what blades we have today. Oh, uh, hello everyone. So uh, we're here at Jason's place. Uh, Jason is a very gracious host. I'm happy to be here, and we I bought some blades along, uh, for us to uh, preview and later on to test cut to it. So here, uh, first the modern ones. So here we have uh, a bangkong. This is from Isabella Basilan. So it's a pretty long version. Right, let me shim it out. There we go. So yes, this is a bangkong. And it's longer than usual. So it's all of uh, 22 inches uh, blade length. Uh, it's very, very nice to wield. Has very good ergonomics. So when I uh when I look for modern blades, when I buy modern blades, one of the things that I really look for is the ergonomics here in the hill. Because uh as a martial artist, I value uh how I'm able to wield the blade. So if a blade has a good handle, fits your hand well, it means that you can do much more stuff with it, right? As opposed to if it has a fat handle. It will limit uh, the techniques that you can do with it. So, yeah, this is one of my favorite modern blades. Uh, later, we'll see if it can cut through bamboo. Can I see? <laughs> yeah, we'll sure, cut sure, through sure. bamboo. So, we can see, look how thick that blade is. So, I'm pretty sure it's going <laughs> to do some damage later. What's the material for, for the hand? I believe Which that's hemp. The, 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 the wrap is hemp. And then they use lacquer for it, uh, in order to secure the hemp. Yeah. And then you have, uh, I'm not sure if that's a uh, madrid cacao wood or, or something of the sort. So you can see it, uh, it's stained, stained wood. Yeah, I appreciate that. Oh, it's better for the grip. Yeah, yeah. All right. So cool. Mora blades have one of the best uh hill traps around. Yeah, it takes some. So I'm getting used to putting it down. So next. And then next, uh, we have here an example of an old blade uh, given new life. So unknown to many people, um, our traditional blades are actually uh, reusable. I mean, if they get uh, damaged in battle, if the hilt gets cracked, if uh, the blade gets cracked, if the scabbard gets uh, damaged, you can always replace it. So it's uh, it's like Lego pieces. As long as you know an artisan who's able to disassemble the pieces and uh, replace those pieces, you can have a serviceable blade. So here, uh, this is actually a vintage piva, uh, also from Basilan. But the hilt here, as you can observe, is already new. So I think it was uh, replaced sometime in the late 90s or early 2000s. So here you can see it's uh, it's still very secure, still very nice grip, still ergonomic. So that's why I prefer it. Uh, this kind of blade, you see uh, the pier has many variations. So this is one of my favorite variations. And the scabbard is also new. Mm. So in this case, since the blade has some age, and the dress or the scabbard and the the hilt is new. Uh, this is what I call a mixed blade because you have a modern feel, but you still get the advantage of having an older blade. Nice. Yeah. That's a good fact to I know uh, to to give people. Because I like and yeah, as you mentioned, even if it's an old blade, you can still give it second life. Yes. Um, I see a lot of pieces posted online where it's just purely the blade. There's no sheet, yeah. there's no handle. Yeah. So you can still purchase them and have it made custom by, by modern artisans for yourself. Yeah. Second life. Nice. So actually, that's the advantage of having um Facebook pages like uh, Philippine, Filipino Traditional Blades headed by Mr. Randy Salazar. Shout out to Sir Randy. 
uh, because of their research, because of their fieldwork, they're able to find us uh, pandais and artisans who are able to emulate either the old form or the modern form of your hilts. So if you have, say, an old blade with no hilt, you just have to check online, oh, this guy looks like he can uh, rehilt or rescabard my blade, my old blade. So again, uh, thank you to Philippine, Filipino Traditional Blades and Mr. Randy Salazar and his team for allowing us uh, a glimpse of uh, our modern pandais and artisans. Another example, uh, this one I got from um, Sir Soviet. So Sir Soviet is a culture bearer of the a clan of the Akianon people. So he helps... Uh, he helps uh, people there, the artisans and the pandais. He mobilizes them. And then he helps them uh, produce um, first the blade, the hilt, and then the scabbard. So there are still a lot of places in the Philippines where it's not one person who creates the whole blade. So in the olden times, you have um, a hilt maker, you have the blade maker, and then you have the scabbard maker. So uh, this was taught to me by Mr. Style Sally Nagarahen. Thank you for that information. So when you have specialization, you will be able to see that everything fits much better and looks much better. So for example, this hilt was made by Mr. Padohino. So you can see I, I really, really like it. It's in the form of a musang. It fits me really well. The guard is well done. And uh, I don't know the pandai who made this, but he was also, I think he's also a fine pandai. So it's a good-looking blade, uh, very stylish. And then finally, there must have been a guy who also made the scabbard. So if you combine those uh, three makers, come up with a really nice modern blade. So uh, nice. this is actually a reminder that it's not always the old blades that are really good. You can also find uh, competitive, well-designed mm -hmm. modern blades. Can I ask about the sheet? Because I see a lot of sheets that yeah. incorporate the coins. Yeah. Uh, what What's the history on that, or what? Why did they do that? Um. Unfortunately, I'm not. I'm not a panay sensor, <laughs> so so I'm not the best person to ask. Hmm. But yeah, there are a lot of traditional blades that incorporate coins. So you can see this. Uh, hmm. in uh, Akiana blades, you can even see this in the southern blades, and then once in a while there would be a random uh Visayan or even Luzon blade that would have a coin. So yeah, usually they put American era coins mm -hmm. or later. Yeah, old coins. Old coins are the ones that are usually installed. Awesome. Okay. Next. Oh yes, next. Okay, okay, so we move on to the my old blades. Um here's a blade uh that was gifted to me. So thank you to Mr. Virgil Apostol for this. So this one is a sinungot ulang profile. So I believe it's Tagalog, possibly from uh, Rizal, Rizal province. So you can see it has a distinct handguard here. Very, very secure. It's a nice grip. And then it has a very prominent uh, pin lock. So this is, this is a pin tang blade, which is uh, typical of Luzon blades. So this must have been around late 1800s, the early 1900s. Here we even see uh, an entry, the equipment of early native constabulary, Luzon, Philippine Islands. So this was most likely uh, collected by an American after the Spanish-American War. So a lot of our old blades are actually sourced nowadays from America. Yeah. Uh, it's no secret that uh, the Americans were able to bring back a lot of uh, blades, uh, especially after the Spanish-American War up to World War II. So they knew the value of our Filipino traditional blades. Uh, they admired it. They uh, they kept it as trophies. Uh, some wanted it as displays in their homes. Some took it for uh, ethnographic research to be stored in museums, personal collections. So nowadays... Uh, Collectors like me, uh, some are here, some are abroad. So it's part of our mission to also bring back, in a modern sense, to, to get back our traditional blades for personal study and research. 
So, uh, in a way, to take back what is ours and hopefully learn from these. So, yeah. That, so they can see. Truly a historical piece. Nice. Awesome. Next. Next, we have, um, this is from Cavite. Um, again, uh, thank you to Mr. Style Sally Nagarahan for the ID on this. So, yeah. This is a clip point. Clip point blade. Very, very wicked uh, clip point there. So, this one was ascertained uh, to be Katipunan era. So, late 1800s. You have a very nice uh, brass handguard. Very secure. You have a very ergonomic uh, hoof hilt here. So it fits my hand really well. And then you have, uh, what do you call this? This type of lock. So this one, there's a screw here instead of the usual pin lock. It's called a threaded tang, I think. Mm -hmm. And then you have the distinctive uh, signature of a diamond here. So based on these uh, features, a blade expert can can tell uh, where the blade came from. I mean, attention to detail. Like they say, the devil is always in the details. Mm -hmm. So if you've seen enough samples, if you've seen enough pictures, if you've done enough research, you can tell by instinct where a blade most likely would have come from. So here we have a very nice uh, scabbard. There, so it has uh, a nice pattern. Yeah, thank you. Super lightweight. Yeah, super lightweight. And yeah, look at the very, very detailed better work. All right. <clears throat> then uh, we move on, of course, to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to most of my collection, which is uh, Moro Blades. So here, we have a panabas with a modern uh, scabbard. Okay. So um, this one would be pre-World War II. So yeah, it's quite long. So thank you to uh, Sir uh, Brolio Agudelo for the ID on this one. So pre-World War II panabas. So you can see how full of purpose <laughs> this, this blade design is. It's pretty thick though. Can take a lot of beating. Heavy duty blade, perfect for two hands. Yeah. I think this is one of your favorite blade types, yeah. right? Absolutely. <laughs> and I appreciate the brass detail. Yeah. And as you were mentioning earlier, this is probably the lock for the blade. It helps secure the blade, it yes. Looks amazing. Yeah. Ganda. You want to eat it? All right. I'll leave it here. And then, of course, uh, one of the blade types, which most people <laughs> really <laughs> like, is the Sulu Batong. The Maroon Fridays that we have. <laughs> yes. So here we have an 1800s Batong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very hefty. Uh, smaller than usual, but really, really solid. So these things are really meant for the battlefield. Yeah. You cannot wield this via Filipino martial arts, mm. you try. Mm. It's it's too... <laughs> yeah. It requires specialized yeah. handling. So um, weapons like these, Molo weapons, must be wielded using the Molo fighting arts. Yeah, we can try it later. I'll be posting some of the videos together with this video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And keep it. Sure. Thank you. I also brought some um, odd samples. So some people think that uh, because in modern time, we tend to have cider custom modern or traditional, the traditional blades only have uh, box builds. Kumbaga, kinahon. Na, ganto lang yung pwedeng hilt, ganto lang yung pwedeng scabbard, ganto lang yung pwedeng blade. But, as I mentioned earlier, since it was a triumvirate, so, meron kang blade maker, hilt maker, scabbard maker. 
there are actually permutations in terms of build. Aside from that, there's also customization. So, syempre, dahil pasadya, pwede ka namang mag-ano na, eh, g- g- ganito yung gusto ko, ganito yung gusto ko na build, ganito, mm-hmm. ganito yung gusto ko na blade. Itong combination medyo weird, pero gusto ko to. So, that is why sometimes you have abnormally long or weird pieces that uh, emerge. So, even the old ones actually have uh, can have a permutation of features. And then there are those at the end of the spectrum, the really odd ones that have been uh, either rehilted, discovered in another place. So here, we have an example of a hybrid. So as you can see, the hilt is of a tenegre, which is mm-hmm. a panay. Discovered is also undoubtedly an ilongo. So it has the brass features. But once you release the blade, it's actually a kris. So yes. So this is an example of a hybrid uh, piece. Yeah. So there have there are uh, other hybrid pieces that exist. Sometimes it's Luzon Saya, sometimes besides Mindanao, sometimes it's even Luzon Mindanao. So if I were a, a, a warrior and I was relocated in another place, of course, I cannot find my preferred artisan. So that's, that, that's one of the scenarios which could have caused hybrids, right? In terms of value, are these higher now or do people still prefer, of course, the pure forms? It depends That's on quite the an interesting mix. So. It depends on the on the uh, on the market and the collector. But because these are pretty odd and pretty rare, yeah, they're usually higher than the standard mm-hmm. ones. Also depends on how well they're preserved. So when it comes to the old ones, there are many variables that, that affect pricing. Okay. So yeah. So you have um uh, you have a Visayas Mindanao hybrid, and then of course we also have. Uh, Luzon, Luzon Mindanao hybrid. So this one, as you can see, the hilt is a dead giveaway that it was rehilted in Luzon. So yeah, this is one of my favorite pieces. So this is made of um, what do you call this antler type of antler. So in the American era, this was a very popular uh build for Luzon blades. And then you have the distinctive pin lock. So it's actually a Luzon hilt with a model blade. Yeah. Feels very nice. Yeah. So I always appreciate the details, the engravings on the blade. Nice. Yeah, feels feels right. So all of these uh old pieces of mine actually um they all came from the U.S. because, as as I said, the Americans really uh, brought brought to the U.S. a lot of our artifacts. So I'm glad that uh, there are a lot of collectors now, even locally, that uh, have this mission to to bring back the old blades, to to feature them in shows like yes, this. Thank you again absolutely. for the exposure, so that our kababayan will have an awareness of uh how these artifacts shape our history our, our culture and how relevant it is to go back and figure out at what point in time were these made who made these were these connected with any historical events mm-hmm. what's the metallurgy what's the martial uh style what's the martial art behind this mm-hmm. so yeah uh when when you go into this uh blade collecting hobby you will really really learn and research a lot yeah it's good that you mentioned that again, no? Uh, like what you said earlier with the barung, um, especially me coming from a Filipino martial arts background, I know Arnis, and when I progressed the blade, naturally, I was using the same techniques that I know with any blade. But apparently, it doesn't really go that way. And as you test the blades, you know, you'll really feel that yeah. I can't really do this kind of strike on a certain blade. Not yes. the same way, at least. Yes, yes. So it's yeah. good to bring that up to light and um, can't wait to test them. Now we're going <laughs> to test and upload the videos as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, awesome, man. So uh, a blade, naman, it will cut. I mean, kung, mm, yeah. kung mo, it will cut. It will it cut, will cut. Yeah. But uh, as my uh, foremost mentor, Master Stal Sali Nagarahin, always says, there's always a correct way of doing things. So even if I can cut with this using Filipino martial arts, 
iba siya kapag more of fighting arts. Kumbaga, iba yung efficiency, iba yung potency, iba yung effect overall. Right. So, yeah, those are the little nuances that uh, people are uh, luckily being made to know na nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks galing, to galing. our information awesome sharing. Awesome information. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks again for this afternoon's chat and we'll test them now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Man.